So once we've recorded and mixed and edited the assets, we take them into our granular pipeline. First stage of that is frequency RPM detection. The sound designer guides this by selecting the fundamental frequency they want to track, tells the tool how many cylinders the engine has, and then the tool figures out the, uh, the pitch curve. The second stage there, um, we use autocorrelation and uh, bias towards zero crossings um, to break the data into grains. And then finally, we take it into this tool where we can preview it and also add um, loop markup. So a common issue with uh, granular systems is they sound great when they're moving, but obviously you need to do something when you hold a steady state RPM. You can't just continually play the same grain. So our approach to that relies on a sound designer marking up, finding regions within the granular asset where the character doesn't change too much. There's no cam change or exhaust pop or burble. They'll mark up these um, regions, and uh, the runtime can pitch correct and, and randomize them um, to provide variation. And if you hold a steady state RPM in game, you'll hear a blend of the two adjacent loops along with the pure granular data. The other thing we added that was really handy here was um, we can optionally optimize the asset at this point. So if your granular data is a little bit too long, once we've sliced it into grains, you can pick a region and just discard a percentage of the grains. Um, so it's a nice, fast way of uh, cutting things down to size. We retain separate engine and exhaust data. So we run two granular synths in game, one for the engine, one for the exhaust. And this is purely for mixed reasons. It allows us to have the exhaust audible over a greater distance. And for a front engine car, it means that we can cone the engine out the front and the exhaust out the back. And that leads to a pleasing transition as a car drives past. We also take advantage of the fact that we're not making a simulation game. We have complete creative control over what a car should sound like. So we'll often mix and match different engines with different exhausts. Because the granular system keeps everything in sync from a pitch point of view, it gives us great flexibility there. We have to consider in a GTA game that the player can get into any car, so there's no really hard cutoff between an NPC car and a player car. So we need to ensure that when that happens, we can transition seamlessly from one to the other. So the approach we took on five, our NPC engines use only the loop data that's marked up in the previous slide by the sound designer. We extract that into its own bank. That forms the NPC engine. And because it's a subset of the player data, we can always guarantee that we can seamlessly transition from one to the other very quickly without um, any audible discontinuity. Another cool feature we added here was um, the ability to sync oscillators to a multiple of the granular clock. So that's the fundamental frequency of the engine. And this is great because we can do subharmonic sweeteners, things like that, um, in sync with the engine uh, layered on top. And once all that's mixed together, we apply some real-time DSP post-processing to add character and also to help with um, supporting modifications to the engine so we make the cars sound different as they're modified. So typically, that's EQ and filtering. We also do a little bit of real-time transient shaping on uh, some assets. So one of the entirely new features that we wanted to add for GTA 5 was a real-time synthesis toolkit. We were particularly excited by the potential for fully responsive and continuously variable procedural assets um, that you can't necessarily create with samples alone. But it was really important to us that sound designers of varying technical backgrounds could benefit from this. So we really had to ensure that the tool was going to encourage experimentation, be as accessible as possible, and uh, generally be fun to use and spend time with. So to that end, we put quite a lot of effort into polishing the uh, user experience. So this is what the tool looks like. Um, it, yeah, fairly standard modular concepts. You drop modules in. The inputs are on the left, outputs on the right. Wire them together with cables. You can see there's a real emphasis on real-time visualization wherever possible. Every input and output has a real-time waveform display showing the data. The cables are animated to show the uh, direction of the signal. Um, but they also show the amplitude of the signal. So you'll see this oscillator cable is pulsing in time with the, uh, the data it's carrying. The biquad obviously is showing a real-time frequency response that's animated based on the input values. The waveforms themselves, you can pause, zoom in, scroll around, generally inspect the signal. Um, we also highlight any samples that are out with the full-scale range. So although we don't clip internally, um, this just gives you a, an idea of where your signal might be a little too hot. And if you were to send it to an output, it would clip. So you can see the red samples there are, uh, are greater than uh, 0 dB FS. And the reflection is just to look cool. The, um, 
<laughs> Another feature the sound designers really like is you can solo uh, any pin. So you just hold the shift key over any input or output, and you can immediately hear the signal at that point. So it's really fast to work out what's going on and uh, figure out what's contributing to the sound you're hearing. The cables are color coded. The green cables are control data. The void cables are audio data. So in this case, the envelope's generating a control signal. You might have noticed the oscillator is generating an, an audio signal, but that's hooked up to a, a green control pin. The tool is smart enough to figure out what you probably mean there is the full scale oscillator sweep. Um, and uh, we also have some diagnostic modules. And the one I'm about to drop in is a, a chart recorder, which just graphs the signal um, over time. This sound is the equivalent of programmer art, by the way. So. So the chart recorder can show either um, control data or you can render audio data with it as well. And our output module has some simple uh, metering and obviously the spectrum display as well. So I've got a few assets from the game. These are real uh, in-game scenes. This is an air conditioning unit, and a pleasing rattle. <laughs> These speakers sound interesting. procedural dubstep generator. <laughs> can create infinite dubstep. This is a bicycle sprocket. This is metal on stone. There's two main elements which we can addition there. So, um, thank you. So overall, <clears throat> this experiment was a great success. We used it to create a wide variety of assets, and particularly asset components. So it wasn't always the case that a synth would provide the ultimate answer, but usually in combination with other techniques like sample-based or granular-based, um, it was a really useful tool, particularly um, good for noise-based sounds. Noise obviously compresses very badly, so if you have noisy assets, they typically generate lots of compression artifacts, and usually you'll need quite a long loop if you want it to sound um, flat. <clears throat> it's a great, therefore, it's a great uh, candidate for, for this kind of synthesis. We also use this tool to enable sound designer authored effects chains. So. Um, where we would have previously coded up some custom bit of DSP, we can now allow a sound designer to have a hook where they can create a custom synth. Um, and that's used extensively in our vehicles, for example. The post-processing is per vehicle, um, per separately for engine exhaust. And it means that the sound designers have the full range of modulation sources and uh, variables um, to drive whatever processing they want to do. Uh, we used similar techniques um, or approaches for our headset speech in games. So one of the big gameplay features that was added in this game was the ability to switch character mid-mission or during key, key moments. And that means that you can play certain parts of the mission from different perspectives. So we were no longer able to bake our um, headset processing offline. So we used this tool to create a distortion um, patch that was applied uh, at runtime. Uh, you might be interested to hear that 35% of the voices that were in the original video were synthesized. 50% um, were samples. So runtime performance is obviously key for this to be useful. That goes back to what I said earlier, where there's no point creating something that looks great that's um, too expensive to use in-game. So we implemented a fairly sophisticated asset pipeline. Uh, similar to compiler at backend, we take the graph of modules that the sound designers created we apply several optimizations, uh, things like constant folding, where we look for um, static values uh, fed in some math that we can process offline rather than in the console, um, but also static branch illumination, 
which is um, great because it means a sound designer can leave some extra diagnostic stuff in their patch or maybe different approaches where they've picked one out of a few um, options. And as long as it's not contributing to the sound, the final sound of the asset, um, we don't pay any cost. We strip it out and there's no memory or CPU cost. And after all these optimizations are applied, the compiler spits out a list of um, procedural operations that run on a custom virtual machine. Because each of these operations has a very fixed cost at runtime, it means that we can measure that cost on all the target platforms and use that to provide real-time performance um, information to the sign designers. So as they're working on their asset, we're running it through the compiler optimizer stuff. Um, we're performing static performance analysis on the resulting bytecode and uh, informing the user exactly how expensive or otherwise their synth is. That's great because it means we can give them budgets to work toward, whereas it's not always intuitive, clearly, um, how expensive an asset's going to be just by looking at it. So the um, kind of unreadable text there is actually a disassembly of the air conditioning sound that you heard. And uh, according to the performance stats, it costs about one and a half times an MP3 decode, um, which clearly in that case is a great win because you would need you know, more than a few voices to create the same amount of variety and uh, variation over time. We also feed these performance stats into our uh, voice management. It used to be nice and simple where every voice had the same cost. And uh, you know, we could rely on that to work to a fixed voice count. Um, whereas now, an asset can be completely varying cost depending on, on the design. Um, same is true for granular. Samples are nice and easy. So rather than working to fix voice costs, we now work to a CPU budget. And um, each asset has a cost associated with it, uh, which um, we subtract from our budget. Once we run out of CPU, we stop allocating voices. So that means that our runtime voice count fluctuates depending on the complexity of the assets that are being played back. The other big challenge for virtualization, which, as I said, is something we've relied on for years, we have no way of knowing uh, how loud a synth asset is going to be until we synthesize it. It's not like a wave where we can analyze it and store the peak value offline. And sadly, there is no magic for that. It's, it's an impossible problem. So we have to solve it through process rather than any technology. So we ensure that sound designers create synths that are loud, basically. Um, they master to a particular peak level, and uh, they try and ensure that any dynamic range is applied externally, so through the sound hierarchy, rather than inside the synth itself. And we do check for that at runtime. Every synth that plays in a debug build, we meter it and see how loud it got. And if it didn't manage to achieve a, a certain threshold, it will get added to a report, and we can ask a sound designer to, uh, to look into it. Um, the other thing we did there, because obviously a sound designer here is free to create um, potential havoc with, um, with filters blowing up and things, um, we did add uh, automated testing of all of our assets. So you run the game with a certain command line. It synthesizes 10 seconds of um, every asset and randomizes the input parameters, looking for any values out with the normal range, non-finite values, that kind of thing. Um, so that helps us ensure that we don't blow anything up.